Emsworthy Mire, only a stone's throw from the tourist honeypots of Haytor and Saddletor, but getting just a fraction of the tens of thousands of visitors who climb them every summer. They're missing out because this place is something special. The 100 hectare nature reserve is run by Devon Wildlife Trust. Their careful stewardship has created a haven that is a throwback to how Dartmoor used to be before intensive grazing and land drainage. It's only when you try and move through a habitat like this you start understanding phrases like mired in confusion or bogged down but they're well worth a visit because just because they're difficult for us humans to move through with our big heavy feet this place is probably one of the most rich and diverse habitats here on the moor it's full of wildlife the distinctive fluffy seed heads of bog cotton are an indicator of soggy ground this is a classic flower found in wet meadow and pasture ragged robin. It suffered a steep decline with more intensive farming and land drainage. And this, as its name implies, a real wetland specialist, marsh lousework. This was once very common but it's now in decline in the south of England. Unusually it draws nutrients by partly parasitising on the roots of nearby plants. Well, no prizes for naming this flower. It is the foxglove. Now their scientific name, Digitalis, comes from the Latin digitus, which means finger. And look what I can do with mine. It fits in there perfectly. Now, the common name foxglove is Anglo-Saxon, and they believed that foxes would put individual flowers on their feet, and it would allow them to creep around with great stealth. And this is a pretty stealthy customer as well. It's a leech, and it uses a sucker at each end of its body to slink along. Now, there are many British species, and they all feed on different creatures and in different ways, but one thing they've all got in common is they like it wet. Are you beginning to see a theme here? There was a pond here, but the Wildlife Trust have taken that pond and they've added to it. They've gilded the lily, as it were, and now it is absolutely heaving. You build it, they will come, and the species have come in the bucket loads. If you're a naturalist or anyone with even the slightest interest in wildflowers or wildlife in general, then this place is paradise. Around the pond, aquatic plants like these water forget-me-nots and this sundew, another plant that loves wet body conditions. It's sticky glandular hairs ready to ensnare any clumsy insect. A lot of the joy of this place is in the minutiae and right here we've got a brown china mark moth which is pretty enough as a moth but where it becomes into its own is the fact that its caterpillars live under the surface of the pond. You can just make out this one's white ovipositor as it lays eggs under the surface. This emperor dragonfly is on patrol, all set to see off anything that encroaches on his territory. This is a broad-bodied chaser, a female. It's fairly common and one of the first species to colonise a newly dug pond. And this is its larval case, or exuvia. You're less likely to get this, though, in your garden pond, a keeled skimmer. They favour acidic heathland and small ponds just like this. There are hundreds here, and this one is preparing for takeoff. As you walk away from the ponds, you find sparse woodland around, great for a bit of impromptu birdie. Now, woodlands at this time of year can be incredibly difficult to birdwatch in, but you come up into the moor where you've got these lovely grassland areas punctuated by scrubby trees, and things get a little bit easier. And there's one bird in particular which can be found here surprisingly easy if it's around. And it does make life even easier by its very distinctive call. I'm talking, of course, about the cuckoo. 
The mire and the fields around are a last bastion for this threatened bird. They are red-listed in severe decline. This male is calling with the unmistakable falling major third. Also around, meadow pipits. This female with a mouth stuffed full of grubs for her young. But she might just be feeding the cuckoo's young chick. Cuckoos here target pipit nests. This cuckoo chick was filmed kicking out a reed warbler's egg and they'll do the same to pipits. But that's why this meadow pipit is having such a go at this much larger male cuckoo. It doesn't seem to be working. This willow warbler is very handily sitting up in full view. You can see his pale legs. No danger of confusing it with a very similar chiff chaff. Thankfully, there's a drier route to and from the mire. It's on higher ground than the western route I took to get onto the marsh. Back near the entrance lie the remnants of the old farm. The place fell out of use decades ago. The Wildlife Trust have put a huge amount of effort into restoring the dry stone walls here. Elsewhere on the moor, many have crumbled into disrepair, but not here. These have been lovingly put back together. And of course, they provide an important part of the conservation plan. With these closed pens, they can control the Dartmoor ponies to avoid the overgrazing that has damaged so much of the moor and the undergrazing that would lead to scrub and gorse becoming too dominant and the grazing helps create one of the reserve's most distinctive experiences. Every spring, the pastures become a vista of bluebells. With the late spring, the season was very short this year. But for those who don't want to tangle with the mire, good to know there's a dry bluebell lined option. This is a lovely spot. Seeds from the sallow catkins dance in the low evening sun. It's every bit as beautiful as the tourist magnet of Hay Tor looming over it. And in the more open countryside, even if you don't get to see a cuckoo, you'll certainly see these stone chats. They abound on the heath, giving off alarm calls as you get nearer and keen to see what you're up to. And this stunner is a common red start. The unmistakable sound of summer in an upland woodland. I'm ending my tour on the northern part of the reserve. This is the magnificently named Snodder's Bottom Brook that feeds another mire named after it. Beautiful demoiselles flit over its fast flowing waters. The males will sit patiently on the vegetation by the stream waiting for females to mate with. Briefly, a small pearl board of fritillary appears but is reluctant to settle. Just by the mire is this splendid ash tree, thought to be 150 years old. It's split in places and has a holly tree and a rowan tree growing out of it. Wow, isn't this magical? There's a certain wisdom to a tree like this. And I have to say this is probably the best example of an ash tree in its mature form, unfettered, untouched by the hands of humans. It is quite something to behold. But I'm also hit with a certain sense of melancholy because not only is this tree near to the end of its natural life, it's probably got maybe 20, 30 years max left, but actually ash trees are in big trouble. Ash dieback disease has been found in this reserve and it's a real possibility that our generation could be the last to actually behold a tree like this. They think there are nearly two million ash trees outside woodlands in Devon and we could lose nearly all of them with devastating consequences for both the look of the county and the wildlife within it. The mire itself is thriving with new life. This cuckoo spit, thrown up as a protection from predators by froghopper nymphs, and these chafer beetles hover over abundant dandelions. But outside the mire, things are not so rosy. It's hard to believe that valley mires like this one, these beautiful, sumptuous, festivals of life were once seen as being something undesirable. Let's face it, they can be a bit treacherous, they're very boggy and soggy underfoot. You can lose your livestock in them and your trailers and your farm machinery can get bogged down. As a consequence, many of them over the moor have been drained. These are incredibly important repositories of all manner of wild species. In fact, most of the Dartmoor icons spend at least part of their life hanging around these mires. They're that rich in life. 
So as a consequence, we really do need to hang on to the few that still remain. Here on Emsworthy Mire, they've coped well with the challenges of keeping a complex habitat healthy. But there are new threats on the horizon, like ash dieback. Let's hope we can keep up that momentum, because places like this are few and far between. <laughs>